Chapter 37 of Anne of the Island. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 37 Full Fledged B.A.'s. I wish I were dead, or that it were tomorrow night, groaned Phil. If you live long enough, both wishes will come true, said Anne calmly. It's easy for you to be serene. You're at home in philosophy. I'm not. And when I think of that horrible paper tomorrow, I quail. If I should fail in it, what would Joe say? You won't fail. How did you get on in Greek today? I don't know. Perhaps it was a good paper, and perhaps it was bad enough to make Homer turn over in his grave. I've studied and mulled over notebooks until I'm incapable of forming an opinion of anything. How thankful little Phil will be when all this examinating is over. Examinating? I never heard such a word. Well, haven't I as good a right to make a word as anyone else? demanded Phil. Words aren't made, they grow, said Anne. Never mind. I begin faintly to discern clear water ahead where no examination breakers loom. Girls, do you... can you realize that our Redmond life is almost over? I can't, said Anne sorrowfully. It seems just yesterday that Pris and I were alone in that crowd of freshmen at Redmond, and now we are seniors in our final examinations. Potent, wise, and reverend seniors, quoted Phil. Do you suppose we really are any wiser than when we came to Redmond? You don't act as if you were by times, said Aunt Jamesina severely. Oh, Aunt Jimsy, haven't we been pretty good girls? Take us by and large, these three winters you've mothered us, pleaded Phil. You've been four of the dearest, sweetest, goodest girls that ever went together through college," averred Aunt Jamesina, who never spoiled a compliment by misplaced economy. But I mistrust you haven't any too much sense yet. It's not to be expected, of course. Experience teaches sense. You can't learn it in a college course. You've been to college four years, and I never was. But I know heaps more than you do, young ladies. There are lots of things that never go by rule. There's a powerful pile of knowledge that you never get at college. There are heaps of things you never learn at school," quoted Stella. Have you learned anything at Redmond except dead languages and geometry and such trash? queried Aunt Jamesina. Oh, yes, I think we have, Auntie," protested Anne. We've learned the truth of what Professor Woodley told us last Philomathic," said Phil. He said, humor is the spiciest condiment in the feast of existence. Laugh at your mistakes, but learn from them. Joke over your troubles, but gather strength from them. Make a jest of your difficulties, but overcome them. Isn't that worth learning, Aunt Jimsy? Yes, it is, dearie when you've learned to laugh at the things that should be laughed at, and not to laugh at those that shouldn't. You've got wisdom and understanding." "'What have you got out of your Redmond course, Anne?' murmured Priscilla aside. "'I think,' said Anne slowly, "'that I really have learned to look upon each little hindrance as a jest, and each great one as the foreshadowing of victory. Summing up, I think that is what Redmond has given me. I shall have to fall back on another Professor Woodley quotation to express what it has done for me," said Priscilla. You remember that he said in his address, there is so much in the world for us all, if we only have the eyes to see it, and the heart to love it, and the hand to gather it to ourselves. So much in men and women, so much in art and literature, so much everywhere in which to delight, and for which to be thankful. I think Redmond has taught me that in some measure, Anne." Judging from what you all say, remarked Aunt Jamesina. The sum and substance is that you can learn, if you've got natural gumption enough, in four years at college, what it would take about twenty years of living to teach you. Well, that justifies higher education in my opinion. It's a matter I was always dubious about before. But what about people who haven't natural gumption, Aunt Jimsy? People who haven't natural gumption never learn," retorted Aunt Jamesina, neither in college nor life. If they live to be a hundred, 
they really don't know anything more than when they were born it's their misfortune not their fault poor souls but those of us who have some gumption should duly thank the lord for it will you please define what gumption is aunt jimsy asked phil no i won't young woman any one who has gumption knows what it is and any one who hasn't can never know what it is so there is no need of defining it the busy days flew by and examinations were over Anne took high honors in English, Priscilla took honors in classics, and Phil in mathematics. Stella obtained a good all-round showing. Then came convocation. "'This is what I would once have called an epoch in my life,' said Anne, as she took Roy's violets out of their box and gazed at them thoughtfully. She meant to carry them, of course, but her eyes wandered to another box on her table. It was filled with lilies of the valley as fresh and fragrant as those which bloomed in the Green Gables yard when June came to Avonlea. Gilbert Blythe's card lay beside it. Anne wondered why Gilbert should have sent her flowers for convocation. She had seen very little of him during the past winter. He had come to Patty's place only one Friday evening since the Christmas holidays, and they rarely met elsewhere. She knew he was studying very hard, aiming at high honors and the Cooper Prize, and he took little part in the social doings of Redmond. Anne's own winter had been quite gay socially. She had seen a good deal of the gardeners. She and Dorothy were very intimate. College circles expected the announcement of her engagement to Roy any day. Anne expected it herself. Yet, just before she left Patty's place for convocation, she flung Roy's violets aside and put Gilbert's lilies of the valley in their place. She could not have told why she did it. Somehow, Old Avonlea days and dreams and friendships seemed very close to her in this attainment of her long-cherished ambitions. She and Gilbert had once pictured out merrily the day on which they should be capped and gowned graduates in arts. The wonderful day had come, and Roy's violets had no place in it. Only her old friend's flowers seemed to belong to this fruition of old blossoming hopes which she had once shared. For years this day had beckoned and allured to her, but when it came, the one single, keen, abiding memory it left with her was not that of the breathless moment when the stately president of Redmond gave her cap and diploma and hailed her B.A. It was not of the flash in Gilbert's eyes when he saw her lilies, nor the puzzled, pained glance Roy gave her as he passed her on the platform. It was not of Aileen Gardner's condescending congratulations or Dorothy's ardent, impulsive good wishes. It was of one strange, unaccountable pang that spoiled this long-expected day for her and left in it a certain faint but enduring flavor of bitterness. The arts graduates gave a graduation dance that night. When Anne dressed for it, she tossed aside the pearl beads she usually wore and took from her trunk the small box that had come to Green Gables on Christmas Day. In it was a thread-like gold chain with a tiny pink enamel heart as a pendant. On the accompanying card was written, With all good wishes from your old chum, Gilbert. Anne, laughing over the memory the enamel heart conjured up, the fatal day when Gilbert had called her carrots and vainly tried to make his peace with a pink candy heart, had written him a nice little note of thanks. But she had never worn the trinket. Tonight she fastened it about her white throat with a dreamy smile. She and Phil walked to Redmond together. Anne walked in silence. Phil chattered of many things. Suddenly she said, "'I heard today that Gilbert Blythe's engagement to Christine Stewart was to be announced as soon as convocation was over. Did you hear anything of it?' "'No,' said Anne. "'I think it's true,' said Phil lightly. Anne did not speak. In the darkness she felt her face burning. She slipped her hand inside her collar and caught at the gold chain. One energetic twist and it gave way. Anne thrust the broken trinket into her pocket. Her hands were trembling and her eyes were smarting. But she was the gayest of all the gay revelers that night and told Gilbert unregretfully that her card was full when he came to ask her for a dance. Afterwards, when she sat with the girls before the dying embers at Patty's place, removing the spring chilliness from their satin skins, none chatted more blithely than she of the day's events. "'Moody Spurgeon Macpherson called here tonight.' after you left said aunt jamesina 
who had sat up to keep the fire on. He didn't know about the graduation dance. That boy ought to sleep with a rubber band around his head to train his ears not to stick out. I had a beau once who did that, and it improved him immensely. It was I who suggested it to him, and he took my advice. But he never forgave me for it. Moody Spurgeon is a very serious young man, yawned Priscilla. He is concerned with graver matters than his ears. He is going to be a minister, you know. Well, I suppose the Lord doesn't regard the ears of a man, said Aunt Jamesina gravely, dropping all further criticism of Moody Spurgeon. Aunt Jamesina had a proper respect for the cloth, even in the case of an unfledged parson. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 of Anne of the Island This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 38 False Dawn Just imagine, this night week I'll be in Avonlea. Delightful thought, said Anne, bending over the box in which she was packing Mrs. Rachel Lynde's quilts. But just imagine, this night week I'll be gone forever from Patty's place. Horrible thought. I wonder if the ghost of all our laughter will echo through the maiden dreams of Miss Patty and Miss Maria," speculated Phil. Miss Patty and Miss Maria were coming home, after having trotted over most of the habitable globe. "'We'll be back the second week in May,' wrote Miss Patty. "'I expect Patty's place will seem rather small after the Hall of the Kings at Karnak, but I never did like big places to live in, and I'll be glad enough to be home again.' When you start traveling late in life, you're apt to do too much of it because you know you haven't much time left, and it's a thing that grows on you. I'm afraid Maria will never be contented again." "'I shall leave here my fancies and dreams to bless the next comer,' said Anne, looking around the blue room wistfully—her pretty blue room, where she had spent three such happy years. She had knelt at its window to pray, and had bent from it to watch the sunset behind the pines. She had heard the autumn raindrops beating against it, and had welcomed the spring robins at its sill. She wondered if old dreams could haunt rooms. If, when one left forever the room where she had joyed and suffered and laughed and wept, something of her, intangible and invisible, yet none the less real, did not remain behind like a voiceful memory. "'I think,' said Phil, "'that a room where one dreams and grieves and rejoices and lives becomes inseparably connected with those processes and acquires a personality of its own. I am sure if I came into this room fifty years from now it would say, Anne, Anne, to me. What nice times we've had here, honey! What chats and jokes and good chummy jamborees! Oh, dear me! I'm to marry Joe in June, and I know I will be rapturously happy. But just now I feel as if I wanted this lovely Redmond life to go on forever. I'm unreasonable enough just now to wish that, too," admitted Anne. No matter what deeper joys may come to us later on, we'll never again have just the same delightful, irresponsible existence we've had here. It's over forever, Phil." "'What are you going to do with Rusty?' asked Phil, as that privileged pussy padded into the room. "'I'm going to take him home with me and Joseph and the Sarah Cat,' announced Aunt Jamesina, following Rusty. It would be a shame to separate those cats, now that they have learned to live together. It's a hard lesson for cats and humans to learn." "'I'm sorry to part with Rusty,' said Anne regretfully, but it would be no use to take him to Green Gables. Marilla detests cats, and Davy would tease his life out. Besides, I don't suppose I'll be home very long. I've been offered the principalship of the Summerside High School." "'Are you going to accept it?' asked Phil. "'I—I I haven't decided yet,' answered Anne, with a confused flush. Phil nodded understandingly. Naturally, Anne's plans could not be settled until Roy had spoken. He would soon, there was no doubt of that. And there was no doubt that Anne would say yes when he said, "'Will you please?' Anne herself regarded the state of affairs with a seldom ruffled complacency. She was deeply in love with Roy. True, it was not just what she had imagined love to be. But was anything in life, Anne asked herself wearily, like one's imagination of it? 
It was the old diamond disillusion of childhood repeated, the same disappointment she had felt when she had first seen the chill sparkle instead of the purple splendor she had anticipated. That's not my idea of a diamond, she had said. But Roy was a dear fellow and they would be very happy together, even if some indefinable zest was missing out of life. When Roy came down that evening and asked Anne to walk in the park, everyone at Patty's place knew what he had come to say, and everyone knew, or thought they knew, what Anne's answer would be. "'Anne is a very fortunate girl,' said Aunt Jamesina. "'I suppose so,' said Stella, shrugging her shoulders. "'Roy is a nice fellow and all that, but there's really nothing in him.' "'That sounds very like a jealous remark, Stella Maynard,' said Aunt Jamesina rebukingly. "'It does, but I'm not jealous,' said Stella calmly. "'I love Anne, and I like Roy. Everybody says she is making a brilliant match, and even Mrs. Gardner thinks her charming now. It all sounds as if it were made in heaven, but I have my doubts. Make the most of that, Aunt Jimsina.' Roy asked Anne to marry him in the little pavilion on the harbor shore where they had talked on the rainy day of their first meeting. Anne thought it very romantic that he should have chosen that spot. And his proposal was as beautifully worded as if he had copied it, as one of Ruby Gillis's lovers had done, out of a deportment of courtship and marriage. The whole effect was quite flawless. And it was also sincere. There was no doubt that Roy meant what he said. There was no false note to jar the symphony. Anne felt that she ought to be thrilling from head to foot. But she wasn't. She was horribly cool. When Roy paused for his answer, she opened her lips to say her fateful yes. And then she found herself trembling as if she were reeling back from a precipice. To her came one of those moments when we realize, as by a blinding flash of illumination, more than all our previous years have taught us. She pulled her hand from Roy's. "'Oh, I can't marry you! I can't! I can't!' she cried wildly. Roy turned pale, and also looked rather foolish. He had, small blame to him, felt very sure. "'What do you mean?' he stammered. "'I mean that I can't marry you,' repeated Anne desperately. "'I thought I could, but I can't.' "'Why can't you?' Roy asked more calmly. "'Because—' I don't care enough for you." A crimson streak came into Roy's face. "'So you've just been amusing yourself these two years?' he said slowly. "'No, no, I haven't,' gasped poor Anne. Oh, how could she explain? She couldn't explain. There are some things that cannot be explained. I did think I cared. Truly I did. But I know now I don't." "'You have ruined my life.' said Roy bitterly. "'Forgive me,' pleaded Anne miserably, with hot cheeks and stinging eyes. Roy turned away and stood for a few minutes looking out seaward. When he came back to Anne he was very pale again. "'You can give me no hope?' he said. Anne shook her head mutely. "'Then good-bye,' said Roy. "'I can't understand it. I can't believe you are not the woman I believe you to be.' But reproaches are idle between us. You are the only woman I can ever love. I thank you for your friendship, at least. Goodbye, Anne. Goodbye, faltered Anne. When Roy had gone she sat for a long time in the pavilion, watching a white mist creeping subtly and remorselessly landward up the harbor. It was her hour of humiliation and self-contempt and shame. Their waves went over her. And yet, underneath it all, was a queer sense of recovered freedom. She slipped into Patty's place in the dusk and escaped to her room, but Phil was there on the window seat. Wait, said Anne, flushing to anticipate the scene. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Phil, Roy asked me to marry him, and I refused. You, you refused him? said Phil blankly. Yes. Anne Shirley. Are you in your senses?" I think so," said Anne wearily. Oh, Phil, don't scold me. You don't understand. I certainly don't understand. You've encouraged Roy Gardner in every way for two years, and now you tell me you've refused him. Then you've just been flirting scandalously with him. Anne, I couldn't have believed it of you. I wasn't flirting with him. 
I honestly thought I cared up to the last minute. And then, well, I just knew I never could marry him. I suppose, said Phil cruelly, that you intended to marry him for his money, and then your better self rose up and prevented you. I didn't. I never thought about his money. Oh, I can't explain it to you any more than I could to him. Well, I certainly think you have treated Roy shamefully, said Phil in exasperation. He's handsome and clever and rich and good. What more do you want? I want someone who belongs in my life. He doesn't. I was swept off my feet at first by his good looks and knack of paying romantic compliments, and later on I thought I must be in love, because he was my dark-eyed ideal. I am bad enough for not knowing my own mind, but you are worse," said Phil. I do know my own mind, protested Anne. The trouble is, my mind changes and then I have to get acquainted with it all over again. Well, I suppose there's no use in saying anything to you. There is no need, Phil. I'm in the dust. This has spoiled everything backwards. I can never think of Redmond days without recalling the humiliation of this evening. Roy despises me, and you despise me, and I despise myself. You poor darling," said Phil, melting. Just come here and let me comfort you. I've no right to scold you. I'd have married Alec or Alonzo if I hadn't met Joe. Oh, Anne, things are so mixed up in real life. They aren't clear-cut and trimmed off, as they are in novels. I hope that no one will ever again ask me to marry him as long as I live," sobbed poor Anne, devoutly believing that she meant it. End of chapter 38